thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. Um, that's a wonderful story to end on. Uh, I, I'm sure after, after you know, what, what three, almost three hours of lectures, uh, the audience uh, would have a lot of questions. So, you know, perhaps uh, we can entertain, or, or maybe before that, Ephraim, uh, the co-moderator of this yes. panel, uh, might want to say something. Thank you very much. Uh, very good lecture. Uh, and uh, the points I would like to yes. um, emphasize yes. uh, is the different frameworks in Chinese thinking and Chinese medicine that is the transform to continue. And yes. the Western thinking is, as you said in surgery, remove, renew. Yes. Uh, this is inside our. Uh, Western, Westernized thinking. Yes. Remove, renew, destroy to, to yes. restart something new. Yes. Yes. And, uh, Chinese thinking is to transform, mm. to continue. So there is mm. not such a breaking, uh, yes. uh, so many breakings. And this is also important in medicine, the practice of medicine. And the other thing is uh, maybe I have a different view. Uh, uh, ab about the function and what you say, the material. The I think Chinese me structure. I think when we practice Chinese medicine, we, we are trying to grasp a relationship between what is the structure and the function. Yes. What emerge, what is emerging, like you say, fire. No? Okay, your face is red. You you are talking like maybe not you, the patient. Yes, yes uh, the patient. Agitated, very agitated, yes. loudly. Yes. yes. And I ask you, let me see your tongue and the yes. tip yes. of your tongue or all your That's tongue right. is very red. Yes. Yes. So what is is some there is something emerging mm. from the structure and the function, yes. and this. Uh, made me remember uh, a philosopher, his name is Zhang Zai, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, from oh, Song Dynasty. Yes, 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 yes. And he emphasized this the relationship between the things. Sit in mm -hmm. front of a bamboo and try to yes. grasp what emerged between you and the bamboo leaves. And mm -hmm. mo uh, most of the people don't say, there's nothing. <laughs> I just sit yes. here two yes. hours and I just see uh, the leaves. Mm -hmm. Here and there, no, there's something that emerged. And this is chi. Mm -hmm. This is chi. That's right. Again, Everything has chi. The doctor yeah. will write a deficiency of chi or a uh, huo, no? you say huo, yeah. fire. Eh? Uh, mm -hmm. So you prescribe something to decrease this fire. Yes. But huo is what emerges between your face, uh, mm -hmm. the observation of face, yeah. of the way you speak, the pulse is very mm -hmm. fast and accelerated, mm -hmm. and the tone that, uh, is red. So right. my conclusion, hua, mm -hmm. hua emerges as a network of, of, yes. of relationships. And this uh, makes me remember uh, of some conversations and some mm -hmm. um, a paper that you wrote, that a concept of field, chang. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the context. It's, yes. Chinese medicine is all about context. And I gotcha. tend to understand th this concept extended in the diagnostic also. I place everything inside mm. this field, yes. like a tensor in, in, gotcha. in mathematics, uh, mm. vectors, and see what, in which direction mm. the, these things are going. But yes. we need to place yes. inside the field. Yes. And this is yes. uh, something that I would yes. like, if it's possible to. And I also place a link uh, yes. in, in the chat about the role yes. of the black activists. It's an invisible oh, right. history in yes. the United States in the yes. 70s. Yes. Mutulu Shakur, that is a father-in-law of uh, a very famous hip hop season, the Tupac Shakur. Uh, he is a, a doctor, an acupuncture yeah. doctor, yeah. and he founded the Lincoln Detox Clinic in South Bronx. And mm -hmm. the results are so, so, uh, they, he belonged to the Black Panthers. Yes. So 
there's not only Nixon and James Reston, but there's yes. another uh, yeah. stream of yeah. actors. Yeah. They, yeah. He came to China also, studied acupuncture mm -hmm. in China, mm -hmm. and founded this clinic. And ah. the results are so positive, so, yes. so positive, that in 78, 200 policemen closed his clinic right. because it, it was perceived as a threat. Yes. No. You are addicted in heroin. You must use methadone, not acupuncture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so now I didn't know about this. Uh, thank you so much. The, yeah. The field. Send me the link. Send me the link, Ephraim. I sent in a. We, in oh, you have sent it to me. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll receive it in due course. And he's currently arrested. Mutulu Shakur is currently arrested. And well, we can see the history there. Let's go to the field. Uh, the issue of field. I think it's very important. Thank mm. you very much. Well, um, Ephraim, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you elaborated uh, and gave more details, and, and I'm very grateful for that. But um, obviously, we, we, we talk on the same wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good because I need the kind of feedback because otherwise I could go be hairy down my own way and it's not constrained if I make a mistake. So I'm glad, you know, by and large, we agree. <laughs> so thank you so much, Ephraim. So would there be questions from the floor, I'm wondering? Now, I couldn't have made myself so clear that nobody had <laughs> any questions to ask. <laughs> There's one, isn't there a Q and A? Um, I, I believe uh, Samuel D has a... Uh raised his hand. So Samuel, would you like to unmute yourself and, and speak? Hi, uh, I'm Lai Shang. Oh, Lai Shang. Yeah, yes, yes. Hi, hi, hi uh, uh, Professor Lee. Yeah. And then for your, uh, for this, uh, uh, for, the, for your, for your talking about that if there is blockage, I mean the body, and then there is pain. And then if there is no blockage, and there is no pain mm -hmm. uh, for our Hong Kong citizens. And, and then uh, there, we believe that when we, uh, when we press uh, or, or touch mm -hmm. our some, some uh, puncture, and then here there is pain, and then this is a blockage because for the circulates of the body of the air, I mean the qi, it, it is a, uh, there is a blockage here, and then there is make that uh, that point uh, is a painful, and then if you uh, to massage it, or yes. or or do some, I mean that if you you use your your hand or that to blockage here, and then move mm. it, move it, and then move it until there is no pain, and then mm. all there is no no blockage and there's no pain, and yes. then your body is a feel better. That's, That's right. very very. The, I, I'm very agree of that. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, yes, because there are various techniques which you rightly draw attention mm -hmm. to that you can use. Uh, apart from pressing uh. and massaging, uh. I believe there's also a method which I myself sometimes use because mm -hmm. I'm a lazy person, where um, I sort of use slapping apparently it also works i've read somewhere i can't remember which medical text it was i read once that an 80 odd year old actor mm -hmm. chinese actor and before he gives a performance you know how long chinese uh, perf theatrical performances can be, <laughs> can be hours so he needs to be in a f uh, fighting fit condition. Mm. So he said before a performance, he always spent about half an hour slapping, slapping himself all over his body. And then he feels energized because he got rid of all the blockages of chi. And then he can go on stage and he will put on a marvelous performance. <laughs> So slapping is also <laughs> good, I believe. Yes. And, uh, and of, of course, some people also burn uh, I what what the Japanese call boxer. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, moxibustion, right? The Japanese call it moxibustion. And as a result, in English, we call it, I don't know, <laughs> it's a really burning eye, eye child, you know, the eye. Mm. Yes. So there are numerous, numerous uh, techniques uh, used. It's a suite of techniques. That, yes. I mean, some, some been uh, um, easier to do oneself and others. And also, of course, people do Tai Chi. Yes, Tai Chi, I think I, uh, I played Tai Chi for many years. Tai and then, one. yes, uh, and then the Tai Chi, the map of Tai Chi is, uh, is a is also uh, is the made by nature, and yes. I mean that because uh, you have the Lao Gong Shi here, yes, yes, yes. yes. and yes. then you have the Yong Chuan Shi on your yes. uh, on your foot, and yes. then and then you have Ba Hui Shi here, yes, bai, bai, yes. Bai, bai, and bai. this also collect here, That's and then right. you practice many years for the Tai Chi, mm -hmm. and then you can make use of the nature of the air by yourself. That, yeah. That's right. yeah. Yeah, it's just that I'm a lazy person. In in China and Hong Kong, it's easier because uh, people do it together in the early yes. morning or whatever. Uh, but in the West, where would I find a group of people? <laughs> <laughs> the police will come and arrest us anyway. <laughs> you know, meet in the park and we do spring that and oh no, 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 no. And I'm I'm being lazy. I just mm -hmm. I do my own very limited type of oh. uh, of exercise and just just to keep going. But yes. I think each one has to find a mode which suits your lifestyle. I think that's basically it, really. Mm. We, we can um, also do it on the Zoom. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I prefer to do those because I don't drive, you see. I go by public transport. Okay. So when I'm sitting on the bus or the train or on a tram, uh -huh. there are exercises that I could do without drawing attention to myself quietly. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and so that's the sort I do. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your for your for, your for your for your for your this lecture. Thank you. I, I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> can I can I ask either uh, Kikok yes. or Ephraim to to comment on the the burning of eye leaves? What what does that do from a, a medicinal perspective? What what? Yeah. What what? You know, what it's not any it's neither acupuncture nor decoction so perhaps you can uh, speak a little more about that over to your effort the expert <laughs> first <laughs> moxibustion the history of moxibustion is even longer than acupuncture a lot of if you see the earlier books uh, you see much more moxibustion, they are prescribing moxibustion than acupuncture. So it's just a way to stimulate this point, a very safe way, uh, because you don't have the risk of cross infection. Because mm. that times if you use, even if you think the, the needles, maybe 2000 years ago, 1000 years ago, they, they don't have the metallurgy, uh, the technology to, the so filiform noodles so it's, it's something dangerous and cross infections so that is a role i forgot the name of a japanese uh, researcher history of chinese medicine and he plays a uh, build a kind of uh, um, storyline the first moxibustion maybe after the fire needle mm -hmm. so you burn the tip of the needle and quickly insert it. so it's a very strong stimulation and after that, acupuncture. So uh, it's a kind of, it's a way to stimulate the points. And you can even woo and shear, tonify, and uh, disperse using moxibustion. Mm -hmm. There are techniques. Yeah, yeah. And there are some also Taoist uh, yes. um, techniques that mm -hmm. they call that, that moxibustion mm -hmm. uh, device as a needle. They call it Lei uh, Hua Jin. Yes, yeah. Thunder needle, but in fact, is a moxibustion, uh, mm. and you apply the points very quickly. Mm. But they call this a needle. Yes. Taoist. 
Yeah. It's so diverse. Yes, it and is. And also, this make me remember something or uh, remind me about the, the concept of body. Even in China, uh, you see different conceptions. Some people that uh, the Taoists uh, they also prescribe some mm -hmm. talismans, and you need yes. to eat something or drink something and make a, a kind of mantras or something else. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's Tao Chiao, uh, not Tao Chiao. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because the, the body for them is not the, only the physical body. Yes. It, and it's linked for many, many, many generations. Of course. Of so they course. try to find what happened in the, with your grand, 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 grandfather. The problem is oh, over yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is affecting your body. So now that's we right. place the moxibustion in this point and you need to do yeah. some rituals yeah. to uh, re-establish yourself yes. uh, harmoniously. Yes, that's universe. right. Yeah. But, now, uh, Efren, I agree with uh, nearly everything you say, but may I disagree with you slightly on one point. I think the timeline that you have given, I don't myself uh, subscribe to it because I don't know how they followed, um, what's it called, archeological exp uh, explorations, excavations, ever since the 1970s onwards. Now, actually, I believe that acupuncture is very, very, very ancient. So ancient that it dates from the Neolithic age. Now I say this because in 1963, if I remember correctly onwards, but beginning in 1963, there was found in Inner Mongolia an artifact or artifacts, which I could, uh, uh, historians of Chinese medicine have now identified to be stone needle, being shi zheng. So they use a stone needle to poke, you know. So so it is, uh, and then of course over the years after the Neolithics departed, then other ages came along, and then by the, then you have silver needles, then bronze needles, different sizes of needles, and finally when you get to the Neijing, you have you know the the so-called nine types of needles. But I believe it is also true. Am I not? I might be mistaken in this, but I seem to have read that the nine types of needles actually so far, unfortunately, there is no. Uh, real archaeological specimens for the nine types. What you see presented as the nine types of needles mentioned in the Lin Shu or whatever are just reconstructions based on what the Lin Shu says. So maybe one of these days, somebody kicking the soil somewhere <laughs> in China <laughs> may bring forth a salad. That would be, be, be marvelous. Uh, so uh, just to go back to the point, yeah. So I think that acupuncture probably, um, I, I, I wouldn't know, it doesn't matter really which precedes what, but I would say that acupuncture based on the Bing uh, Shi Zheng would, be, would date from the, from the Neolithic period. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly know, I've not read anything about the eye when it comes in, but probably I would imagine it might come in after the culture, Chinese culture and civilization became an agricultural culture, became sedentary, because I is a plant, you say. So people would then become interested in plants, what sort of plants to eat, which are edible, what sort of plants have medicinal purposes, and if they have medicinal purposes, to look out for them, and indeed even to domesticate and cultivate them within their own gardens. Now, that is only speculation in the absence of texts ancient enough to tell us on the absence of archaeological finding uh, we, we, it, it just doesn't matter which which comes first uh, they, they they are there from a very early age we, we have a, a question from uh, yeah. Ephraim, please please yeah, yeah. it's important to in the end i think we find a little point that yes. maybe 
the acupuncture was um, don't didn't deserve so much respect from the academics or let me say because in the uh, books writing books from Tang Dynasty or before you only see moxibustion you don't very ah. few prescriptions use the needle place this needle and uh, no and the textus receptus of Nijin is recent it's not so uh, uh, like Han uh, is from Song Dynasty. Oh, and right, right, right. We always need to remember that what the academics, the scholars write is different from what, what the people are practice. <laughs> Sometimes right. what the people mm. are doing, mm. they are using the stone needles much more. There is a very interesting paper. I, I think it's from yeah. Vivienne Lo, The Spirit mm. of Stone, when she discusses about this. Very beautiful paper. Mm. Different kinds of stones also. Yes, yes. It's not, it's I'm not sure. a tiny <laughs> stone you use for as a needle. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Chinese also look to the stone and say, "Oh, this stone is very precious. They have a spirit." That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, of course, of course. Stone, <laughs> they they do. A needle, stone. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Anyway, let's proceed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, Ephraim, again, if I beg to differ from you slightly uh, on on what you have just said, and. Uh, uh, that is um, the I think the texts do bear out the ancient uh, lineage of acupuncture. If you go back to being Che, who is supposed to be legendary, but actually, that modern scholarship says that behind that legend it was a real person who was a brilliant uh, uh, physician. And apparently his method, his preferred method was uh, acupuncture, okay. not anything else. And of course, when you come to Tang times, you have Sun Si Miao. Now Sun Si Miao was a practitioner of both. He was expert both at acupuncture and at uh, decoction. So he combined, he combined it too. But I think a bit in chair um, uh, legend, so to speak. I don't think it's a legend. You can deconstruct a legend to come to the real person who was actually, you know, but he practiced acupuncture. So again, you see, it depends on um, the, I think it will change. It will alter as the years go by. As more evidence come in, scholars re-evaluate exist extend evidence in the light of the new one, and so it 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 is not a static thing. Uh, what what happens? So I think we just have to keep an eye open and to see what the community of scholars have to say are uh, on the subject. Yes. Agree. Agree. Thank you. Um, I, I see Gustavo uh, Esteva, who was our speaker on, on the very first day of the conference. Ah. I, I was wondering if you'd uh, like to comment or, or ask a question. If, if not, uh, is, is there anyone else who would like to, to share their thoughts? Maybe people are exhausted. If not, <laughs> if not maybe I will like to ask you, Tony. Yeah, uh, yeah. Your Please, opinion. Uh, uh, repeat my question from yesterday, but you are at leave the time. Uh, uh, oh, remind me what, about the question. About the, we needed to free our minds from the westernization. Right. Mm -hmm. De decolonize our minds to, to better grasp Chinese medicine. Yeah. And I, the, in the very start of uh, Professor Lee's um, lecture, she said that she's a practical philosopher. And I think this word is very beautiful and very useful for all the students of Chinese medicine, practitioners, because we need to be more practical philosophers to grasp mm -hmm. these. But my question is how we decolonize 
in a world that is constantly recolonizing us. So the, the West, we tend as I come from the clinic. When I first uh, read about it, oh, let's forget the Western uh, framework. I tend to believe that this framework is a static target. Mm. But no, this is a constantly evolving and right. perfecting. One example mm. is uh, IT. Yeah. Yes. It's something that yes. can be very useful to yes. Chinese medicine and so on. But uh, I say, as I say yesterday, what I see is the doctors looking more to the screen, more, using more yeah. time to, to the computer <laughs> screen than to the patient because they need to input all the data correctly in, in the system. Yeah. Otherwise, they would be punished. Maybe there is some, someone who sue them. It's different from the old Lao Jungi that they write like a... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barely yeah, yeah. can understand what they write, but they are paying attention in trying to grasp these. So when we break one chain, we realize there are 10 other chains, right, right. much more sophisticated. Right. And right. Professor right. Lee said that we need to work in multiple fronts. And I agree. Mm. Mm. Yes. I, would like to see, I would like to listen your opinion. Your, yes, a very quick opinion. response to your very complex question. And it is this, there is corruption indeed. And many people, in fact, these days, uh, people you know, who believe in um, biomedicine, before they go to see their doctor, they Google, you know, they type in all their symptoms, and then they find that uh, it comes up with a particular diagnosis. And then and only then they will go to see the doctor. Uh, and then they say, doctor, I have this. And the doctor then finds out they've been Googling. <laughs> <laughs> and I also tell you, this kind of um, bio, uh, uh, tech, uh, info technology has also corrupted some uh, Chinese practi uh, medical practitioners. That are not, of course, the high-grade ones, but what, not the Shang Gong or even the Zhong Gong, but the Xia Gong. Apparently, this was years ago even, when I visited my elder sister in Vancouver, she used to live, she's passed away now, but she used to live in Vancouver. And she told me this, these funny stories about the Chinese medical practitioners in Vancouver. And she said, do you know what they do? So I said, what do they do? She said, when you come up, they don't do it in front of you. They retreat to behind the curtain or another room and they consult their computer and in you know using the Chinese uh, version of Google <laughs> or Baidu or whatever, and then they then come back and tell you what is wrong. <laughs> so you see, you see. So oh, no need to take your mind, no need to reject your tongue, no need to do anything. You <laughs> just go behind the screen or in another room and they type in <laughs> a few things, and lo and behold, you get. <laughs> So currently you can go to the Facebook and, and know Facebook. all the history of life of patients. No, I know that yesterday you eat in a some because people post everything they eat that they do. So yes. oh I think you are over exercised because you post about exercise all the time. Uh, it's very easy. Yes, anyway, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to keep modernity at bay is very difficult. <laughs> very, very, very difficult. And, yeah. and I think I think this gets to the question or the comment that Nicoletta was making yesterday. Yes. Um, and it does get at the general problem um, of of trying to deal with, you know, this modern phenomenon, mm -hmm. um, which which I think Gusteva spoke about on on the very first day as well. Um, to, to the extent that I, I, I think it's probably accurate to say that most people would find uh, understanding, you know, the principles of Chinese cosmology uh, rather, rather alien. And, and I would count mm -hmm. even Chinese students among them, at least the Chinese mm -hmm. students that I teach. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, try, I teach Chinese culture and society. And these concepts of yin and yang seem to be very abstract. Right. Yeah. So, so Ephraim, I, I mean, I think this is a discussion we could all have together. You know, how do you overcome 
uh, this problem when <laughs> you know the practitioners yeah. themselves are just drawn to screens rather than to the people uh, whom they are supposed to be examining. <laughs> uh, so you're right. It's, it's, go on. We need to embrace, but I, I don't agree that we need to uh, uh, have a conflict. No. Conflict to our relationship. We need mm. to embrace, but not accept. Embrace is different to accept. When you see two people uh, uh, like using Kung Fu, Kung Fu, or Aikido, or Tai Chi, when someone hit, try to hit you, you embrace that mm. that movement. Mm. You embrace, but you mm. transform that. Mm. If, because if you refuse, mm. if you are weaker, mm. you will break yourself. You break your arms. You can't refuse uh, someone stronger than you, especially when the framework is stronger than you, more powerful mm. than you. Mm. So embrace, mm. embrace, but not accept. Embrace mm. to change. Mm. Not a conflictual and uh, mm. uh, let's reject this, mm. but not accept. Is mm. not a radical. Uh, okay, I don't talk with you. I don't want to see. No, let's dialogue. Mm. Even fighting, you can dialogue. <laughs> mm. Mm. When you see people fighting, you, you, uh, especially martial arts, is a kind of dialogue. Mm. Yes, yes. I embrace what your movement and. Uh, you embrace my movement. I try mm. to neutralize. You try to neutralize. Mm. Mm. I try to transform. Mm. So I think this is a, maybe a, a, a way. Mm. Because I see so many people know I will not use computers. Mm. I reject artificial artificial intelligence is something very important very, that will help a lot when the uh, how to say the IBM computer blue. Uh, I forgot the name, defeated Gary Kasparov. Mm. A lot of people believe yeah. that the chess is over. But no, yeah. it opened more possibilities to study a deeper chess. But in that time, they say chess is over. A computer defeated the greatest chess player in the world. No. So you can you use know? technology. Technology yes. will not substitute acupuncture, a Chinese bed, a well-trained a, a Chinese medicine doctor. Yes. Technology will help us and helping us to go deeper. Mm. But if we understand technology in this way, if mm. you understand the technology, it's just okay, let me my life be easier and I, I can treat more patients and earn more money, etc. One more chain, another chain. Well, Ephraim, may I add uh, something to you? The next time someone tells you how clever a computer program is, which can defeat, you know, people who play or uh, who play not only Western chess, but Wei Qi as well. Wei Qi is supposed to be more complex than uh, Western chess. But if, even if a computer, my retort is always this, look, mate, I'm not over impressed about your computer winning. I said, a computer? What is a computer? A computer is just a program which picks the brains of thousands of human individuals and their brains. So we are not dispensing with human brains and their thinking. We are simply pulling them together, sticking them up into an algorithm and say that the computer has done the thinking. The computer has not done the thinking. We human beings have done the thinking. So I don't buy that. I don't buy that. And I always say, what comes to the worst in a dystopia where machines take over us, they rule our lives, I said fools, we human beings would be to buy such a stupid ideology that we no longer can control machines. I said, the only thing you can do is to pull out the bloody plug. And the machine will stop working. Huh? So I said, there are always ways and means if there is the political will. Now, the important thing is the political will. Some people like to worship before certain idols, and it's very difficult to get them not to worship certain idols. But that is the important, difficult thing. It's not because we humans are not in charge. Some of us willingly give up our control of things. Mm. Now, that is the difficult thing. But uh, relating to another point, again, 
I don't know whether you have um, come across this Ephraim in your in your practice in Manchester when people. Uh, I mean, my husband uses Chinese medicine a lot. Touch wood, touch wood, so five don't need really to go and consult them because I managed to keep reasonably healthy. But but my husband, you know, has lots of uh, weak spots in him. So he's, he's been kept afloat and kept healthy all these years, you know, 30, 40, 35 years or so via Chinese medicine, so he goes, and he's a much more passionate, fervent follower than I am, <laughs> because of his own personal uh, <laughs> medical history. Uh, and I noticed that in these uh, Chinese medical practices, um, what we see amongst the patients are not so much so-called Anglo-Saxon people, but ethnic minority groups. So in other words, you know, West Indians, Africans, who are in, uh, in, uh, Indians of, of uh, um, um, Arabs, you know, all these different ethnic groups. There are plenty of diverse eth ethnicities in Manchester. It's a very cosmopolitan place. And well, I, we seem to see more of these people. So uh, in other words, then, uh, the Western Anglo-Saxon mind, so to speak, I call it the Anglo-Saxon mind, um, for lack of a better term, um, it's very difficult to penetrate. Whereas the other ethnicities are more open, in other words, and they accept, you know, therefore Chinese medicine much more readily than I think um, the Anglo Saxon. Although, having said that, it's not true. There are some consultants in the NHS who are perfectly Anglo Saxon, I suppose, for certain ailments, when, which, when they have themselves no further way of helping, they actually send their patients to Chinese practitioners. For instance, I do know of uh, one lot of consultants they might have retired by now working in London because the women who come to them who are infertile, they have done all they could to help them to conceive, but they failed. Then they send them to the Chinese uh, practitioner in London and they, uh, and, uh, and they get joy. And so the reputation goes and slowly, slowly, you know, it grows that, uh, it grows uh, uh, that way. And also I'm sure too that, um, that's why, and, and the second point, I think I'm not totally uh, pessimistic because I think whether we like it or not, and it's a sad fact of life, we don't like it, but we've got to accept it, that the perception of an activity, of an intellectual activity, like a medical activity, depends on people's general perception of the standing of the culture of which it is a part. Now, in the past, unfortunately, Chinese history, Chinese culture, Chinese civilization has been down in the dumps, you know, um, Nobody respects China. It's uh, you know, no, especially over the business of the nineteenth century when China was very much humiliated. But now, towards the end of the twentieth century and the beginning of the century, things have changed. Yeah? So all the geopoliticians are now talking about. America becoming a fading major power, great power, and China on the rise. Now, much as I abhor this, you've got to recognize that when a civilization and an economy is perceived to be rising in its economic muscle, people look upon the other bits of your culture in a better light. So they are, oh, the Chinese are not so bad, you know. <laughs> And more and more people. So I trust that forces of geopolitics may help Chinese to promote Chinese culture. Not the amount that you and I write in a book. Nobody would read those books without this backing, geopolitical backing. But perhaps eventually, with the help of geopolitical backing, some people may pay more attention to our book, uh, to the books that we write on the subject, and it will help, you know. Every little thing helps, in other words. Uh, on so that that's note, all I can say. On, on that note uh, that uh, Helpful, helps uh, just raise. Optimistic 
Yes, on, on that note that Kikok just raised, someone in the audience is, is curious to know from the Chinese audience uh, how, how Ephraim knows so much about Chinese medicine. Ah. The, the question is, uh, if you can tell a bit of your own story. Mm -hmm. So you, you, are, you are obviously not a Chinese person. How did you come to, <laughs> to know so much about Chinese That's medicine? That's because he's an eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I start to well, my first contact with Chinese medicine was when very early when I was practicing martial arts in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I was very curious because a lot of people got injured and the master treated them with needles, no medicine. And wow, this is amazing. But I was just uh, 14 years old, and I was exposed to this. And after I went to study biomedical science in, in Campinas University, São Paulo, so after read Tao Te Ching, I Ching, because my master always said, you need to read these books, they are very important. So I was thinking, wow, the, all the world is like an ecosystem. And, uh, study ecology was very good but the study biochemistry anatomy was terrible <laughs> i can't understand why we need to separate and everything and after i decided to study chinese medicine and i used to live more than 10 years in china so now i'm based in thailand so uh, since more than 25 years studying <laughs> and i'm still a rookie <laughs> I'm still trying to, to grasp the basics. <laughs> Thanks. And that is a short story. Thank you. Thank you, Ephraim. There's another question uh, from the audience. Um, this is directed to uh, Kikok. It yeah. says, I'm inspired by your lecture. Chinese medicine is a culture embedded in a cosmology. You said that Western medicine seldom refers to past history and Western medicine took a leap only in the last several centuries. Yes. From your perspective, what could be the possibilities of development uh, for Chinese and uh, Western medicine? Um, that's, that's, that, that's the question, yep. Right, okay. What would be the difficulties uh, for their convergence? That's the, the last ah, point. Mm. Right, right. Now, uh, I myself personally, I'm not looking for convergence because to converge, you can talk to each other. That's no doubt correct. You have overlapping uh, places, but basically, Biomedicine is not the same system as Chinese medicine. So in terms of its philosophical framework, etc., and in terms of the causal models, they are very, very different. So in that sense, you cannot just marry one off to the other just like that, uh, because it's not like yin yang and hoping you know that they form a complementary whole because it is like uh, two people um, um each one with their own model <laughs> but very different so they are overlapping areas but not that they cannot be total co uh, total um similarities so differences and similarities the similarities allow you to have overlapping concerns, but the differences will mean that you still uh, remain, se uh, uh, remain separate. However, I am still optimistic, not because Chinese philosophy is going to, uh, and Chinese medicine is going to change. It's very unlikely that Chinese philosophy and Chinese medicine are going to change. Chinese philosophy and Chinese medicine has not changed for more than 2,000 years. I cannot say it's immediately changing just like that. However, let me put it this way. It is a Western philosophy 
and Western medicine, which is going to change. And they are slowly, slowly inching their way from their original standpoint to a standpoint which is nearer and nearer the Chinese version. And that is where the convergence will lie. So there'll be more overlapping uh, areas. Now, let me use a metaphor. Uh, let me use fashions, right? Uh, in the days when I had to teach, I couldn't go in, in jeans, so I always wear skirts. But I don't like short skirts, so I always wear long skirts. So whether whatever the fashion of the day may be, I always wear my long skirt. Whether it's a mini skirt, mini, mini skirt, I still wear my ankle length long skirt. So I can't be bothered because it's not my style. You see, I'm not going to change my style to suit the, the modern youths of my day. So they can laugh at me if they wish, but I keep my way. So I said, oh, fashions change, you know. After a while, people will move from mini skirt it's a long skirt. And when the moment comes when this you know, little long skirt becomes fashionable, I will be in fashion. So there will come a moment when I will be in fashion and the mini skirted ones won't be in fashion. So I wait for the world to change. So Chinese medicine, I think, is a bit like that. It stays its course. For over 2,000 years, it has stayed its course. But I notice that slowly, slowly, there are changes in biomedicine. So biomedicine is no longer the sort of um, uh, uh, unchanging entity, which I might have painted it just now in my lectures. It's just to make a, a, a good debate, right? But you can see bunts, uh, seeds of, of, of moving. As I say, uh, a Nobel Prize winner in modern medicine had already said that reductionism is not the correct model, it's holism. So what does that mean? It's moving towards a Chinese model, right? Mm -hmm. That, uh, so, 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 um, as, as I mentioned uh, in, in, in another uh, uh, in the interview, I think it was, uh, which was done, um, that there is even such a thing gingerly appearing in the last few years called ecological medicine. And ecological medicine is but ecosystem thinking situating the patient in the context of society, of the particular group, social grouping in society. And we see it all over again in with COVID-19, because the COVID-19 now the medical scientists have to admit, you cannot understand COVID-19 just in terms of SARS-CoV-2 as a virus. You've got to understand SARS-CoV-2, why it takes place in a particular individual, why the particular individual, instead of having asymptomatic uh, condition, have, symptom, have symptoms, which is called COVID-19, why certain people get COVID-19 and other people don't. It's because of their occupation, which expose them more to COVID-19 than other people like an academic sitting, you know, behind a screen, uh, where, well, people who are, let's say, uh, uh, healthcare workers, who are um, uh, security men, who are policemen, um, bus drivers, uh, care workers, nurses, so on and so forth. They have got to deal with the public, right? The public can maybe infected. And so they expose themselves. So it's a question of both exposure from the external environment, if you remember my ecosystem, my evil nesting, um, and, um, also your personal conditions, because some people suffer from comorbidities. For instance, people who already are diabetic, if they catch COVID, uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, then it's, it might kill them. Whereas if someone has no comorbidities, they may catch it, for a few days, they might be uncomfortable, but after that, nothing further bad happens. So we each, so this is where personalized a, a, a personal medicine comes in. We each react to a virus, to a pathogen in a different manner. So to understand all these complexities, I'm afraid 
I use my example of ecosystem nesting to explain that how it is ecosystem thinking that we, we, we need. And Chinese medicine is ecosystem science, is ecosystem thinking. So if epidemiologists and in, indeed, indeed even uh, clinicians in the West are now in Western medicine are now slowly moving to this more complex model, there is hope. There's hope, I think. So the Chinese don't need to do anything. We stand still. It's not because by standing still, we are backward. It's just that by standing still, we allow others, um, it sounds arrogant, to catch up. <laughs> Maybe that's not the right word to use. <laughs> uh, to come to, an, uh, to yeah. an understanding that we Chinese medical side have something to offer, which is valid mm. Mm. and valuable. Mm. Let's so, put it more neutrally that way. Huh? So you've you've answered part of this uh, following question from uh, Li yeah. Jialing. Uh, she she yeah. says here, I learned a lot from Professor Li's lectures. It amazes me that she could comprehend two completely different systems of medical philosophy and made it so easy for, for us to understand. I'm wondering if Professor Li could elaborate more on the future. Do you believe facing an uncertain time such as COVID-19 when neither system knows about the exactly effective treatment. These two systems will be given a chance to collaborate with each other, or maybe the opposite. Hmm. Uh, I, I think you've got to um, answer the question by specifying which part of the world you are talking from about. Now, in the West, I think there is probably less likelihood of that happening, although this is not to rule it out by, 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 any, uh, by any means. Um, in the West, I think, again, perhaps the impetus may come from America. Not because America intentionally is a pioneer, I'm not saying that, but unintentionally, indirectly, it may be pushing people there. And this is in connection with what Ephraim said that he had sent on to me an email. Now, because American society is very polarized in terms of wealth, there are people with private insurance, medicine, there are people without. Now, those people without, how would you cope if you have COVID-19? If you can at all afford it, you will go say to a Chinese practitioner who might be able to help, but it doesn't roll in your pocket quite so much and you can afford to. So, so that is that. And once one lot of people find satisfaction with the medicine, then word begins to spread. And eventually, eventually, one fine day, <laughs> you know, the status of that medicine will be made more available. So that is how I think for some quirk of American society, I think the impetus, one impetus may, 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 may come from that. Now, we are talking about another part of the world, another thing which is, I believe, very, very encouraging is in mainland China itself. Because from my sources, what is happening in mainland China, a lot of young Chinese people, not elderly folks like myself, but young Chinese people are increasingly turning to, uh, to uh, uh, their own medicine. And over COVID-19, a lot of people, young or old, are turning to, uh, to Chinese medicine for help. So I think that is also an, an, an encouraging. So I think slowly, slowly, bit by bit, with the help also of, as I said, geopolitical reasons, maybe the status of Chinese medicine will slowly improve in the eyes of people. Yeah, thank you, you so much. Yes, yes, we, yes. We need to keep in mind that the so-called New normal. Uh, yes. This new normal, in my point of view, means that we doctors, we will face, or everyone will face a new normal when the misery is normal, when the poverty is normal, the people are not more sensibilized by the refugees. This crisis yes. is ongoing. 
is ongoing. Opioid crisis, yes. epidemic yes. is ongoing, mm -hmm. and people they're not more sensible for that. Yes. <laughs> they just want to post in their Instagrams and live there inside their bubbles, and mm -hmm. these things are ongoing, and the new uh -huh. normal. Uh, yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> very, very tough, tough times. Yes, 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 we are. Misery we are. will be normal. When mm. the oppressors will oppress much more. So acupuncture, well, Chinese whole... medicine, if you see the history, especially in the Western uh, uh, world, they always was considered not only by the Western medical doctors, but uh, this is a kind of subversive. How can you treat someone without medicine, just mm. with needles mm. or uh, uh, moxibustion? Mm. No. Uh, so we need to keep this in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Our role yeah. in this new normal is very important. Mm. Yeah. It's very well, important. Yes. We need to be together. Uh, uh, Ephraim. Ephraim, I agree with every word you say, but I remain slightly optimistic. You know why? Because Western medicine is also developing new technologies which could be helpful, which could be helpful to an understanding of Chinese medicine. I'll give you just one example. Modern Western medicine, biomedicine, has now developed very sophisticated technology in which they could biomarkers. These are called biomarkers. And some of these biomarkers are so sophisticated that if you take a sample from the patient before the medical intervention and take another sample after the medical intervention and they compare the pathological condition between these samples, they will find a difference. Now, there are some people who then say that not to charge this medicine on its own required this, but if Western skept medical skeptics uh, want a confirmation that when you, as the acupuncturist, um, you know, stick a needle there and you diagnose that this is the right spot, there, 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 and then, right. Now, in theory, what you can do is to get the patient to go and get whatever biomarkers uh, they believe in, right? You pay for it. You don't have to pay for it. They go and, and get it. And then you do your operation on them. After a bit, when they feel subjectively better, that doesn't count in Western medicine. Subjectivity is no good. You have to have objectivity. So you send them back to have another pea sample or blood sample or feces sample, whatever sample it is, which is relevant, and get a new reading of the biomarker. And you'll find that actually there's a correlation between their feeling better, your intervention, and the lowering of the quantity of the pathogenic variable as a biomarker. So to the Western skeptic, they will then say, oh, there might be something there. Not that you as the medical practice, Chinese medical, you need it, but it is to shut the skeptics up. <laughs> you need this kind of very advanced uh, biotechnology uh, to, 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 to sort things out. So just as, I'll give you another example, which comes from Hao Shan. Hao Shan one day, gave a series of lectures somewhere, oh, I can't remember where, in the Ukraine, somewhere in the Ukraine. And a journalist appeared, and the journalist said that he had been uh, using biomedicine for a long time. Uh, he had high blood, very high blood pressure, you say. And um, he, he, it helped him, he said, temporarily to reduce his um, uh, his high blood pressure. But nevertheless, you know, he was uh, not well at all. And also, after the treatment by biomedicine, he always had very bad side effects for about a week. So he's very loath to go them. He said when he cannot stand it anymore, then he goes because he has to suffer a week of the after effects. So he went to this lecture to report on how Anshan and how. So he offered himself 
as a guinea pig to Hao Wangshan. So Hao Wangshan diagnosed him. And Hao Wangshan did what is called ear acupuncture. Now, I'll describe to you how what he did. If I remember, I might have remembered wrong. <laughs> he said he rubbed the tip of his ear like this, rub and rub and rub until it becomes red and it softened. Then he put some um, antibacterial uh, lotion on it to clear it. And then he put the needle and he pressed it on that point, which I can't remember what point it is that he pressed. I'll have to check my notes. It was on that point. Okay. And he said in China, when you use that treatment, the acupuncture treatment, only a few drops of blood will come out. But he knew that if a few drops of blood come out, it is being efficacious, it's very effective. But in this case in the Ukraine, he said, my goodness me, he said, a, a real river of blood started to come from that point, you know. So he said, oh dear, I've never come across this miracle. But it probably means it's working. <laughs> There's so much blood. <laughs> because that man had never been subjected to acupuncture before. So his reaction, therefore, was quite different from Chinese patients who will have you know, acupuncture uh, all the time in their lives. So anyway. And the man after this said, oh, he felt marvelous. So, uh, and then the, I think the man, in, in a sense, then did biomarker check. And indeed, his blood pressure had gone down, you know, to the satisfaction of biomedical medicine. Uh, that it was not simply a placebo effect or an imaginative effect that he had. So you see, you can use biomedicine to defeat people's skepticism so that Chinese medicine can finally enjoy being enjoyed and appreciated and recognized in its own right. Not that the Chinese medicine requires this, but it's to shut up the skeptical voices, I think, that it could be helpful. Just, to, just to very quickly, just to yes. um, point that uh, my, uh, just to, my point of view uh, is that what about what I said is that and more for the social point of view. Yes. Okay? Because uh, in, there are people that are not receiving even medicine, even food, no bio biomarkers, oh, yes. no vaccine, uh, no. no but the whole country can rush. I know. I have friends that work in India, inside the slums. I have friends that work inside refugee camps of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. They're doing acupuncture. <laughs> they don't have nothing. No. <laughs> Where's the medicine? Acupuncture. <laughs> so we, we, Chinese medicine can play a, a very important role uh, in this new normal that I call new abnormal. <laughs> anyway, it, it's like- But unfortunately, Chinese medicine cannot cure inequality, yeah. cannot yeah. cure poverty on its yeah. own. <laughs> So, every, that's right. It is a, a world problem of a world inequality, oh, and that's very, um, that's uh, difficult to solve enough as it is. <laughs> well, so, well, well, um, I I think um, I think this entire conference is built uh, around these concerns. So, you know, mm -hmm. we will be discussing these things a lot more in the, in the next couple of weeks, uh, in the next three weeks, I think. Um, but before we end, I, I, I see that we're almost at 10.30. I, I think Chianin wanted to say something, is that is that right? Um, so yes, maybe yes, you can I ask can, the final No, I'm question. good. Um, th thanks for asking. I already uh, posted a question and Professor Yi has already answered the question, which is- oh, Okay. Sure. Yeah, it's great and thank you so much. I okay. learned commandments from the lectures. All right. Well, if that's the case, then uh, once again, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. And especially thank you, uh, Professor Lee Heacock. And thanks a lot, uh, Ephraim, for uh, joining this discussion. Let's, let's continue with this because obviously, you know, we've, we've not, the, the problem is a very big one. Um, so thank you again, and uh, we'll, we'll see you in the next and, few days. And, yes, and before we say goodbye or arrivederci or whatever, let me say, you know, may I thank 
you know, the entire lot of people working behind the scenes, in front of the scheme, screen, everywhere, <laughs> to make this possible for us to talk to uh, one another and for us to explore, you know, my at least one interpretation of Chinese medicine together. Thank you so very much, one and all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Take much. Care. Thank you, Kiko. Bye-bye. <laughs> right, right. See you, see you in the next few days. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.